Mongol dynasty, the Yuan dynasty, which ruled China from the middle of the 13th through the middle of the 14th century, was fraught with internal divisions and problems as it moved into the middle decades of the 14th century. And that was when uh, a series of circumstances arose that really led uh, pretty directly to its collapse and replacement by a new dynasty with a Chinese, a restored Chinese ruling elite. As we talked about last time, the Mongol uh, government, the imperial court, was paralyzed in many ways by conflicts both within the Mongol nobility and amongst different factions of the literati officials who had returned to greater influence at court but hadn't really been able to translate that into effective government because they were so internally um, factionalized and divided. Um, those very human political circumstances meant that the government of the Yuan dynasty was not, um, not very effective, not very efficient, and as we will see, was, was incapable of really responding to a fairly serious and, and, and uh, challenging set of circumstances. What these were uh, stemmed from, uh, basically, a great plague that struck central China, uh, particularly the valley of the Yangtze River, uh, in the 1340s, uh, late in the 1340s. It appears, uh, as best we can tell, that this was a plague outbreak related to uh, uh, the Great uh, Black Death that sweeps Europe at a roughly the same time. Uh, they may have had a common point of origin, perhaps in uh, India, uh, and made their way both west and east uh, along various trade routes. One way or another, the uh, mortality that the plague brings to central China was uh, intense, and in some instances, in some communities, perhaps as 50%, uh, as much as 50% of the population uh, may have died. That, of course, is, uh, is bad enough in and of itself, but it led to a variety of other problems uh, because when the population of certain areas, particularly along the great rivers, uh, uh, dropped off, uh, there were insufficient revenues and insufficient labor resources to maintain things like uh, the river dikes, uh, and that led to uh, breakdowns in, in uh, control of the river, flooding, which in turn generated further disease, further devastation, uh, in, a, in a sort of downward spiral of circumstances that led to the deaths of, of uh, many millions uh, of people. Because of the political conflicts at the court and because of circumstances in local society, neither the Mongol state nor the local elites mounted an effective response to these conditions. Uh, they didn't go out and organize relief efforts. They didn't uh, uh, try to provide medical assistance. They didn't uh, put, uh, uh, say, the army in place and use them to uh, restore or, or maintain uh, the river control system, uh, but instead uh, there was very little response. There was very little effective effort on the part of higher authority to deal with these circumstances, and year after year the situation in central China uh, continued to deteriorate. The local elites, who in, in many instances we would expect to be the ones who would step into uh, uh, the gap and, and take up many of these quasi-governmental or even governmental functions, uh, did not do so. They were afraid, they were apparently uh, uh, quite terrified of, of the disease and uh, uh, of insecurity, and they tended to turn inward, to hoard what resources they had and to protect themselves. Um, this meant that there was really no one on the ground uh, in, in a sort of official or even semi-official capacity that was addressing uh, the concerns at hand. As a result of this, um, popular movements rose up, groups of peasants, uh, sometimes with, uh, with uh, uh, relatively effective local leadership, began to organize themselves to seize the resources that they needed to uh, basically become bandits uh, and rebels, and uh, these spread throughout, uh, particularly the central and lower uh, uh, Yangtze River Valley. The, um, the only group, the only sort of institutional force in this period that played uh, much of a, uh, a positive role at all 
uh, were the Buddhist monasteries. And it is in their capacity as institutions that could provide some relief, could provide shelter or food, uh, in some instances uh, medical care, um, that we encounter uh, the individual who will uh, prove to be uh, the, the main protagonist of the, the story of the transition from the Mongols uh, to the Ming Dynasty. And this is a gentleman uh, that we know uh, as Zhu Yuanzhang. Zhu, the family name, Yuanzhang, uh, his given name. Now, Zhu Yuanzhang was himself an orphan. Uh, his parents had died in the disasters of uh, the mid-century. He himself had suffered from uh, smallpox, but had managed to survive that, uh, although his face was heavily uh, uh, marked by the disease. And as a young man, he had lived uh, basically as, as an itinerant. Uh, not exactly a Buddhist monk, but going from monastery to monastery, relying upon the, um, the services which were available there. The monasteries had rules about how long you could stay to protect themselves from simply being overwhelmed by uh, the needy. But uh, 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 Zhu Yuanzhang would go from one place to another and eventually became drawn into some of these uh, uh, mystical peasant movements that were growing up uh, along the course of the Yangtze as local people simply had to find ways to organize themselves uh, uh, to survive. And of course this put them in a status of rebellion or, or outlawry in relation to um, the, the uh, official regime. Now, Ji Yuan Zhang uh, becomes involved with one of these groups uh, known as the Red Turbans, and his military skills and his sort of native intelligence made him uh, very effective, and he rises fairly quickly to a position of significant influence uh, within the leadership of the movement. Indeed, by the early 1360s, he's able to take over uh, the movement, and when he does so, he begins to subtly reposition it uh, and himself, uh, moving away a little bit from the more um, millenarian aspects of uh, the movement, the idea of a sort of apocalyptic upheaval which was going to transform the world by bringing compassionate spiritual beings in and uh, casting down the mighty and raising up the lowly and all this. Uh, a very uh, standard sort of motif in Chinese uh, popular mysticism. But Zhu Yuanzhang, when he becomes leader, um, conceives the ambition, and we don't know how early on he had this ambition, but certainly by the early 1360s he begins to act on it, of not simply presiding over a, a mystic movement of peasants, but of trying to found a new dynasty, to overthrow uh, the reign of the Mongols, and to, uh, to create a new order, a new state, uh, with himself uh, at the head. In 1368, he formally proclaims this new dynasty, to which he gives the name Ming. Uh, Ming means bright. Uh, the character is a combination of the sun and the moon, so it's all the brightness uh, uh, you could want. Uh, and this is to manifest his, um, his leadership, his brilliance, uh, as he presides over the establishment of his new order. He launches a military campaign, takes his armies, which have now uh, consolidated his, his uh, rule, his dominance in the Yangtze River Valley, and marches north uh, towards the Mongol capital at Dadu. Uh, but there is no great uh, apocalyptic confrontation. Uh, the Mongols, uh, perhaps weary of the, uh, the political infighting and the, uh, uh, the, the disasters which have uh, plagued their, their rule in recent decades, uh, basically abandon uh, the city and retreat across the mountains out to the grasslands. And Zhu Yuanzhang is able to seize uh, Dadu uh, and to uh, uh, take control uh, of North China. He decides to return south and establishes his capital uh, at uh, the site of the modern-day city of Nanjing on the Yangtze River in the area that he had first uh, uh, controlled when he he rose to prominence, but he leaves one of his sons, Zhu Di, uh, in command of the former Mongol capital uh, to uh, maintain it as a defensive post against the possible return of the Mongols. Well, Zhu Yuanzhang, uh, from his new capital in Nanjing, uh, of course he has to pursue the further uh, consolidation of his authority over China, and there are a series of military campaigns about this, but his principal task now is to set about creating uh, the institutions of a new 
uh, dynasty. And a Confucian state uh, is the model that he adopts. Uh, it's, it's basically the only uh, successful model uh, to hand, and he sets about putting in place the, the proper um, uh, bureaucracy and bringing into that bureaucracy the right uh, people to run it. And of course, this means uh, uh, relying on the literati once again. He um, reinstates the Confucian examination system. He holds examinations in 1370, just two years after the founding uh, of the dynasty. But he immediately suspends them. He doesn't trust the literati, and in some ways, he's, he's, in, he's in some ways comparable here to what we had seen with the Mongols when they established their power. He doesn't trust the literati. He thinks that uh, they didn't behave very well during the crises of the, uh, the late 1340s and 1350s uh, as, as members of the local elites. Um, he also, being uh, uh, not very well educated himself, is mistrustful of them, of their literary sophistication, their obscure language, their, their difficult uh, writing system. And so he's, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, a troubled relationship. He recognizes the necessity of relying upon them. He's not trying to, uh, to rule China without the literati, but he wants to keep them as firmly under his control uh, as possible. So. He uh, gives the examinations a try in 1370, but then suspends them for a decade because he doesn't like the outcome. He doesn't feel comfortable with the successful examination candidates. In 1380, he reinst reinstates the examinations, and indeed they run from 1380 uh, pretty much without interruption until 1905. So that's the last significant uh, uh, challenge to the examination system. But he still mistrusts uh, the literary gentlemen, the, the products of the examination system. Indeed, in the same year that he uh, brings the examinations back, um, he becomes suspicious of his chief minister, a man named Hu Weiyong, uh, and he uh, comes to believe that uh, Hu is plotting against him, and he uh, uh, purges Hu Weiyong, has him executed, and uh, is far from satisfied with that and goes on to execute uh, or have executed uh, everyone who worked with Hu Weiyong, uh, all the members of his family out to, to several degrees of relation, uh, members of the families of people who worked for him. Thousands of people wind up being killed uh, in this great purge in 1380. This proves to be the beginning of a, a pattern with uh, Zhu Yuanzhang. Um, he, from time to time, during the remaining years of his rule, uh, has these episodes where he becomes convinced that someone is plotting against him and launches these very, very bloody purges uh, to, uh, to eradicate his, uh, his enemies. Now, of course, it doesn't take long for members of the official bureaucracy to start to worry that they may be the potential next victims. And of course, once they start talking amongst themselves about, gee, what do you think is going on with the emperor? Uh, how can we protect ourselves? Uh, this can begin to look to the emperor like some sort of conspiracy. And so, you know, it kind of, it kind of becomes a cycle that feeds upon itself. And these purges recur uh, several times. Tens of thousands of people wind up uh, being killed uh, in the course of these political upheavals. In some ways, um, almost a more serious consequence of these events is that when uh, uh, Zhu Yuanzhang orders the head of his chief minister to be cut off in 1380, he also cuts off the, the institutional head of government. He abolishes the office of chief minister uh, and takes the administrative functions which had belonged to the chief minister into his own hands. Now, when you have an emperor like Zhu Yuanzhang, who's a very, very active, very hands-on kind of ruler, who spent uh, perhaps 16 to 20 hours a day uh, administering, being the emperor, uh, sleeping very little, reading uh, or having read to him large volumes of, of documents and commenting on them, making lots of decisions himself, um, this may be all right, abolishing the position of chief minister, taking these functions into his own hands. That's okay if you have someone who's so deeply engaged with administration. But as we'll see, 
uh, that becomes problematic later in the dynasty when we have emperors who are not so dynamic, not so uh, competent, not so uh, deeply engaged and involved in the day-to-day management of political affairs. Well, Ji Yuanzhang reigns until 1398. He is emperor, uh, known as the Hongwu Emperor, uh, from 1368 to 1398. When he dies in 1398, one can imagine that there must have been quite the collective sigh of relief from his uh, Confucian officials. He was succeeded by um, one of his grandsons, uh, a man named Zhu Yunwen. And this grandson was the eldest son of Zhu Yuanzhang's eldest son. And in the normal line of succession, the emperor's eldest son would become the next emperor. When uh, Zhu Yuanzhang died, his eldest son had already predeceased him. And so he had to make a decision about the succession. And what he chose to do was to pass the throne to the eldest son of his eldest son. This, however, was resented by some of the brothers uh, of uh, uh, but some of Ji Yuanzhang's other sons, some of the brothers of the, of the man who had already died. And uh, in particular, it was resented by Zhu Di. Zhu Di was the fourth son of uh, Zhu Yuanzhang, but by this time, by the end of the 1390s, he was the oldest of the surviving sons, and he basically felt uh, that he should have become uh, the emperor. He also uh, began quite quickly to view his nephew uh, uh, as, uh, as betraying the, the heritage of uh, Zhu Yuanzhang. Zhu Yuanzhang, as we've talked about, had this extremely problematic relationship with the Confucian officials, with the literati, and he tended to keep them on a very, very short leash to sort of terrorize them from time to time with these purges and generally to have um, uh, basically an antagonistic relationship with them. He had to have them, he needed them, but, but he never was, was comfortable with them. Uh, Zhu Yunwen, the new emperor, uh, had grown up uh, in the palace had grown up surrounded by uh, Confucian officials, had been educated in the Confucian classics, was a highly literate uh, young man, uh, and very different from his grandfather, had never been a military campaigner, and was basically just a very different kind of individual. He signaled his views, his uh, sort of uh, uh, cultural orientation in the name that he chose for the period of time that he was on the throne, what we call a, a reign title. Zhu uh, Yuanzhang, the founding emperor of the Ming, had selected the reign title Hongwu, which means vast martial virtue and, and was uh, emphasized his, his position as a warrior and a hero. Zhu uh, Yunwen adopts the title uh, of Jianwen, uh, and Jianwen means to nourish the cultural, to nourish the literary. Okay? So he was signaling through this and through his other actions that he was going to have a much closer working relationship with the literati officials. Far from mistrusting them, he really relied upon them. Indeed, in some ways, he thought of himself as one of them. He identified with the same sorts of values and ideals uh, that, the, uh, that the Confucian uh, officials did. Well. Judy, looking at this, saw uh, his nephew as um, not seeking a more viable relationship with his officials, but as betraying, uh, undermining the, the political culture which had been put in place uh, by the founding emperor. And so he began to uh, maneuver to take the throne for himself. And particularly between 1400 and 1402, uh, he, he carried out a series of uh, political uh, and military actions which were designed to put the pressure on, uh, on his nephew. Um, in 1402, he led his military forces to the south, attacked the capital uh, at Nanjing, and, uh, and seized the throne. Um, when he did so, he proclaimed himself uh, emperor. He becomes uh, the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty, although in the official historiography for over 150 years, uh, his nephew's reign was simply erased, and, and he presented himself as the second emperor, as if he had simply taken over directly from his father. Eventually, uh, the Jianwen emperor is put back in the official history, uh, but that uh, takes place uh, uh, quite a while later. 
Um, now, Judy faced some problems when he seized the throne because he was not uh, the legitimate emperor. He was a usurper. And he uh, first had to deal with the fact that many of the Confucian officials would not recognize his usurpation, his, uh, his seizure of power. In particular, uh, a man named Fang Xiaoru uh, defied him in open court when the emperor ordered uh, Fang to write an edict proclaiming that he, uh, Zhu Di was the legitimate emperor, uh, Fang Xiaoru refused to do so, and he was uh, rather brutally executed along with other uh, officials who refused to accept uh, uh, Zhu Di's uh, seizure of power. Nonetheless, um, although he had been critical of his nephew and although he intended to uh, restore the, uh, the proper line of succession as he saw it and to to respect and honor uh, uh, Zhu Yuanzhang as the founding emperor, in practice, uh, Zhu Di was much more uh, uh, friendly, I suppose you could say. He had a much better relationship with uh, the Confucian officials than his father had. He does not uh, return uh, after the, the, uh, the executions uh, associated with his seizure of power. He does not return to a pattern of these sort of periodic purges of, of attacking the um, uh, the officials uh, from time to time. And instead, he begins to cultivate a much more positive relationship with, uh, with his officials uh, once, of course, they have accepted uh, the legitimacy of his position. In particular, he becomes involved with building up the power of one institution within uh, the central government, and this is what's called the Grand Secretariat. Um, the Grand Secretariat technically was simply a, a, a document processing office. Uh, uh, edicts that were going to be issued, proclamations that were going to be made, reports coming in from officials uh, in the provinces or from the uh, government ministries in the capital, uh, memorials, requests for funds, things like that. All this paperwork passed through the Grand Secretariat. What Judy does is to imbue the Grand Secretariat with uh, a consultative function. He, he, gives it, uh, he gives the officials who are the leaders of the Grand Secretariat in particular um, the role of counselors, of advisors to him as the emperor. And this begins to, uh, to make the Grand Secretariat into uh, really the most important uh, policy-making, policy-formulating body uh, within the imperial government. Uh, the other great legacy that Judy leaves is the city of Beijing, the capital of the Ming Dynasty from 1420 on, uh, and the capital of China today uh, is this great city built at the uh, northern end of the North China Plain. He takes over this site uh, at the time of uh, uh, the overthrow of the Mongols. He's made uh, prince of this particular location and. Uh, has already lived there most of his adult life, uh, and when he is emperor, he decides to move the imperial capital from Nanjing to Beijing, and indeed the names of these cities today stem from uh, his actions in the 14 teens. Nanjing means southern capital, Beijing means northern capital, and so he moves from the southern capital to the northern capital, although he keeps Nanjing as a secondary center, a subsidiary uh, uh, political center as well. Um, he moves 100,000 families of uh, carpenters and artisans of various kinds uh, up to the north so that they can build a great capital. Uh, the palaces that are at the heart of, uh, of the imperial city that still stand in, in central Beijing today uh, date from this uh, uh, time. He moves the, the sort of center of the city a little bit south. The old Mongol city was a little bit further uh, uh, north uh, than, than the present-day uh, center of Beijing, but, uh, but basically builds on the, the site of the Mongol capital and makes this his uh, administrative center. And it remains the capital, uh, except for a brief period in the, in the uh, uh, first half of the 20th century, from 1420 uh, on down to today. Now, under uh, Judy, who, who reigns, by the way, I should mention his uh, reign title too, because often uh, the Ming emperors are referred to both ways. He's known as the Yongle Emperor. Uh, Yongle means uh, eternal happiness or eternal joy or sometimes uh, 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 everlasting, uh, uh, everlasting happiness, something like that. Um, 
Under his reign, uh, China embarks upon um, a, a, a very unusual undertaking. And uh, I want to just take a few minutes to talk about this because it's a subject that is uh, often of, uh, of great interest and, and has recently come in for some, uh, uh, some popular uh, attention in, in, uh, in books and, and articles. Uh, and these are a series of voyages. Uh, great fleet is assembled, is built, uh, and uh, beginning about 1405 and running down indeed even after uh, the death of Judea in, in 1424, these voyages continue for another uh, decade. Um, a series of seven of these great exploratory voyages are sent out uh, by China to Southeast Asia, to the Indian Ocean, to the east coast of Africa, to the Persian Gulf. They are commanded by a man named Zheng He, uh, and Zheng He is um, uh, a eunuch, uh, probably uh, a Muslim. Uh, he comes from a part of the southeast China coast uh, where uh, many Muslim trading families had uh, lived for, for generations, if not centuries. Um, and he, uh, he is placed in command of these great uh, expeditions. Uh, hundreds of ships uh, were involved, and the largest of these ships were several times the size uh, of the vessels that uh, Columbus commanded when he sailed across the Atlantic um, about uh, 70 years later. And the, uh, the, the Ming voyages, as they're called, or the voyages of Zheng He, as they're sometimes referred to, um, went all over, uh, all over what for the Chinese in many ways was the known world. Um, there are uh, uh, records of these uh, uh, ships coming to ports all over uh, Southeast Asia and, and the Indian Ocean, uh, monuments that were erected by the Chinese when they traveled uh, and made these port calls uh, are still in place in many areas. Um, uh, Chinese trade goods, which uh, had preceded the great voyages, Chinese uh, maritime traders had been traveling over these same uh, routes for centuries. Uh, it, what's, what's unique about Zheng He's voyages is that they were official. They were, they were launched by the Chinese government, not by private traders. Uh, and Chinese trade goods are found uh, all over this region uh, as well, including uh, on the east uh, coast of Africa. These voyages, um, there's been a lot of debate uh, within uh, the ranks of Chinese historians, both at the time and, and since, about why they were launched uh, and then, of course, about why they were stopped. Some people argue that uh, uh, they were launched because Zhu Di wanted to find uh, his nephew when, when uh, he occupied Nanjing in 1402 and the imperial palace was burned, the body of the Genwen emperor was never located. And there were rumors that he had escaped and was living in Southeast Asia and might return to claim the throne someday. And so some people speculate that the voyages were launched to, um, to seek him out. It seems rather a, uh, a massive uh, undertaking for such an objective. Um, more likely is simply the desire of Zhu Yuanzhang to demonstrate his power, uh, to um, uh, show the, the glory of China, and perhaps to demonstrate the legitimacy of his rule uh, by uh, showing the flag, by exploring uh, officially, sending uh, representatives to many of the countries, many of the places uh, that regularly traded with China. The end of the expeditions I think is actually a lot more easy to understand than why they were launched in the first place. Uh, the voyages were discontinued after 1435, uh, as we'll see in the next lecture. By this time, there's a significant reorientation uh, within the imperial state, within the sort of political culture of China, and a return to more traditional uh, strategic concerns, which were largely directed not towards the sea, not towards the maritime world uh, beyond China's coast, but to the, uh, the inner Asian frontiers where uh, Chinese had uh, perceived strategic threats originating uh, for, for thousands of years already. Um, by that time, uh, new emperors, younger emperors were, were on the throne. The Grand Secretariat was even more powerful than it had been under uh, Judi, and uh, China was was moving into a, a new era of internal expansion and development. Um, we'll pick up the story of the Middle Ming and the, the growth of uh, the economy and the uh, 
uh, elaboration of social and cultural life in the next lecture.